Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, we're going to be talking child safety. So all the parents out there with kids and are looking for tips and better ways to keep your child safe, or if you have friends that need to keep their child safe, make sure you pass this on to them. Because today I am joined by child safety expert, Mark Wilhelmson. Mark is an author. He also has our child's keeper and the baby and safety master course. So we're going to be talking about child safety and how he got into this and the nearly tragic events that occurred to get him to help others and make sure that it doesn't happen to them. So Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Curtis. Appreciate it. Why don't you start off by just giving everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Sure. Well, I'm in California now, but I used to live in on the East Coast in New York. And I was an investigator in New York City for over 26 years. And it's it's relevant as far as my background is concerned, because what ended up happening is I had four kids. I have four kids. And my son, Marcus, had just turned two years old. And, you know, just like any other morning, I would just, you know, make them breakfast. And my wife was sleeping. She was a nurse. So she was up. She had a long shift. And I happened to, you know, cut up some fruit for Marcus. And and I, importantly, I was actually this is one of the one of the safety tips that I didn't even realize I was doing at the time. I just got lucky. Was I was actually when I was feeding him, I was actually sitting across from him. And that's that's one of the things I want to highlight right away is to is to is to always watch your kids when you're feeding them, so you know if there's a problem because choking in itself is a It's a largely silent event. You're really not going to know what's happening until, unless you have eyes on the person. But what happened was, is, you know, my son, you know, as as he was eating his breakfast and some fresh fruit, he, he just, just everything stopped and I was sitting across from him and it was just completely silent. And his eyes just kind of like, he looked up at me and you could see that there was something wrong. I didn't connect the dots right away. What ends up happening in these kind of scenarios is, you know, you everybody kind of freezes. And but then what became apparent was that he was choking. Um, and what was you know embarrassing about it, followed by anger, to be perfectly frank with you, was was here I am a father of four and I didn't know what to do. So I froze, I panicked, and I was admittedly, you know, relying, it seems it was subconscious, but I was relying on luck. And that's what saved him, not me. What, what children will typically do if, if they are choking is, you know, parents sometimes will, you know, rush after them. And what that'll end up doing is actually it'll startle them. And they'll try to take like a reflexive uh, breath in and it can actually cause whatever they're obstructing on to go further down their throat, causing more of a problem. And so, you know, one of the things that happened with Marcus is that, you know, I didn't do that because I was just completely frozen. And what ended up happening is he was actually able to cough it up eventually on his own, which is something that, you know, parents really need to know is that if you ever see your you know, child like coughing heavily, you know, let them do that, you know, because a lot of the time they're actually able to get it out on their own. And so what happened after that event, like I said, was I really made a vow to him and to my other kids that it will never happen again. I said, you know, how could I have four kids and not know something so basic, right? And so that brings me back to my history as an investigator. I really started to take a look at, you know, why didn't I even have this on my radar, right? As a father of four, why was that? And uh, it was just simply ignorance on my part, or was it something a little bit more widespread? And that's when I started to do the investigating, really. And to go several layers deep on the issue and to just really uncover what the actual problems were, not only in the U.S. here, but worldwide. Well, I think in my opinion, the reason that you had four kids and you might feel like you didn't know what to do is that 
we don't we don't have more people like you, you know, putting it out there and saying, hey, here's what you need to do, you know, and kind of giving that tip that, hey, if they're choking or something, don't go at them too fast, because that's the first thing you want to do. You want to run towards them and try to help. But you brought out, hey, if you do that, they can take the breath and get it deeper in. And nobody I have two kids, two, nine and, and five. And even in the parenting classes, I've never heard nobody tell us that. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And that's really what I try to do with with my book is to really, you know, what are the common, but also the uncommon? What are the things that that parents have are really surprised when they hear them? That that's one of them. And so that's yeah, what I did. And speaking with, of that book, yeah. uh, tell us about it, wh- why you're on it and, and why you decide to write it. Yeah. For that very reason you're talking about, Curtis, because, you know, at, at the end of the day, statistically speaking, there's a safety organization called Make Safe Happen. I believe it's just makesafehappen.com. And, you know, they have a statistic that 72% of parents aren't even aware that the number one cause of childhood deaths is from unintentional injuries. And that's a shocker to a lot of people. And it's a shocker to me. It was a shocker to me. And it's still to this day is kind of one of those things that, you know, we, we hear some stories on, you know, on TV sometimes of celebrities, you know, who've lost their children to a drowning or something like that. And that temporarily wakes us up a little bit, but most people, you know, it's just something that kind of goes by the wayside after that, you know, and that's why I wanted to write the book. I was like, all right, well, if this is a really an awareness issue, then you need to have these books. You need to have sort of a community starting to be built up. And part of the thing I wanted to do with this book also is to not only highlight the, the, the uncommon and the common, but also understand that it's not just about, you know, Curtis, you with your, with your kids, it's like, well, what if you want to go, you know, and, and go out and have the kids taken care of by somebody else? you know, will they know what to do? Right. And so that's why for me, this book was really about highlighting these issues, not only what the problems are, but a lot of people just talk about the problems, not the solutions, but also make sure that the solutions really come at, you know, the reality of human beings and what I'll describe what that means. So, you know, we, we process visual 60 times faster than text. So in other words, if you have a book, you know, that's great. You're going to learn, you know, a ton, but you really have to go over it, you know, multiple times to really get a visual, really get an understanding of what's going on. Um, And so in, in sort of parallel to this book, I created a masterclass. And so it's basically this book in video form. So when you're talking about, you know, how do you perform newborn CPR, you know, instead of reading about it and like having, you know, illustrations, I actually go on video and show parents what to do, exactly what to do. And also I, I will, you know, tell parents as well, Hey, listen, if you're going to have, you know, your parents come watch your kids, or you're going to, um, you know, have a babysitter or a nanny watch the kids, have them come over like 15 minutes early and just watch the age specific, how to save your child from choking or how to perform CPR. I mean, take seven minutes, right. Or 10 minutes, and just go over that skill set so they're aware, they're thinking about it, they're careful how they cut up their food. You know, so it's those types of things that I really wanted to highlight in the book, along with making sure they're aware of the fact that there's a masterclass where they can learn uh, visually as well. Well, you also talk about how the parents are the first line of defense and preventing accidental injuries and deaths, not the police or fire department or 911 or anything like that. Tell us your reasoning behind that. Sure. I mean, and and that's, I want to be super clear that, you know, when it comes to EMTs, I have a good friend of mine who's an EMT and and some of the tips from him are actually in this book. And as well as, you know, police officers, good friends of mine are my daughter's godfather's a police officer. So it's not a knock on them at all. It's just the reality of the situation is when I was doing my research that the average response time of 911 in the U.S. nationally is over 10 minutes. So when you really think about that, you know, a child can become unconscious in under two minutes. So we really are in a position where we're like, okay, well, the parents are in, are in the single best position to be able to save their own children. But it really starts with learning a core set of fundamental life-saving skills. And I use the word skill for a reason, because what, what happened with me, Curtis, is that, you know, right after this happened with my son, 
Marcus, I, I got really shook up. I contacted a local CPR instructor. I went down and got certified, you know, in adult or excuse me, infant, child and adult CPR. And, and then I thought, okay, well, I'm certified. You know, I passed. It was great. It was a wonderful, you know, couple of hours that I was there. But, you know, in doing the research for the book and, you know, within about 24 hours, the way our memories work, we'll forget about 65% of what we just learned. And within 48 hours, it'll be up to 85%. So it's sort of like scoring an A on a Monday and failing that same test on a Wednesday. So when it comes to life-saving skills, you can't fail on Thursday or Wednesday, right? And, and the, there's sort of a false sense of security that you get from a certification because you actually don't need to get them every two years. So the thought that we would somehow learn something on a Saturday over a couple hours and then you know in a year and a half down the line or even a month down the line, be able to really save someone's life is, is very naive. And it's just the reality of, of our memories. And now the other thing too, we talk about 911, um, the dispatchers, like they do an amazing job, but you know, 911 is auditory. So in 65% of us approximately are visual learners. So, you know, when we're talking to 911 and she says, for instance, you know, you know, hold your baby at a 45 degree angle where the feet are higher than the head, the head lower than the feet and, you know, strike their back in between the shoulder blades five times with the heel of your hand. You know, it's like, you're, you're just, you're in a panic state to begin with. So your ability to really understand and, and, and perform these life-saving maneuvers is, is, is near, near zero. And so you, you can only do your best, right? So for me, I say skill because I really want parents, encourage parents, if it's not for me, from somebody, you know, have these skills in visual form and video form, learn the skills, and then go back through them, refresh those skills, you know, at least every month and make sure that it actually is a skill. You know, a skill is a skill. A skill is something that you're, you know, you actually understand and that you're able to perform well, right? So you're proficient in it. And it's not really that if it's just something, you know, that that's easily forgotten. You really have to learn what to do because we, when you think about panic, we really only panic when we don't have the skills to solve the problem, right? And so if, if your child really needs you, that's when they need you the most is when something like an emergency happens. And so the only way you're going to remain calm is if you know what you're doing, if you're skilled. And I just wanted to mention one quick thing too, that's, that's super important. I just want to try to miss this point is that when you hear infant child and adult CPR, the infant part is up to the age of one after the age of one, the, the it's considered a child, right? From one until approximate puberty, how you save a baby or an infant under the age of one and how you save a child over the age of one are two entirely different skill sets. So even if you are a parent, you know, who are, who is really conscious about this and you learn these skills for your baby, well, once they hit one, you're handling that scenario completely differently, right? So that's another important thing. So for me, with the, that's why I call it the baby and child safety masterclass is, is so we want to follow whether you're expecting, you know, you're an expecting parent, we want you to be able to access these these classes before you even give birth, ideally. And then we follow you all the way through. There's no age, you know, this curse having two kids, there's no age where you don't want to know how to save them, right? That, that never goes away. And so I designed the class to make sure that they can be in, they can be with us for years. It never, we have 24 seven, it's on demand, it's online, they can access it anytime. And to me, that was as far as solutions were con- concerned, the sort of the best way of doing it. And I'm working on some other technology with, uh, with Alexa and some voice assisted, which we're going to be releasing within the next six months, which is super exciting, but I don't want to talk about it quite yet, but it's, it's really, really exciting stuff. I got a couple of questions about your master course, but first I want you to talk about the fundamental life-saving tips that every parent should know or life life-saving skills, I should say. Well, I would say the most, based on statistics, you know, you really want, you're really looking at uh, different things depending on their age. But as far as the macro, we're looking at CPR, age-specific CPR, 
We're looking at, you know, choking, you know, how do you save your child? How do you save your baby from choking? Drowning is, is a huge problem. Um, and that, that problem does not, you know, that, that problem sticks with us until statistically speaking, until, you know, you're, you're, you know, 13, 14, even as high as 19. So, you know, as far as drowning is concerned, it's, it's the leading cause of injury related death among children ages one to four. But again, it follows them far beyond that up to age 19, there are about a little bit less than a thousand. As far as the last statistic I, I found was back in 2018, there were 918 children under the age of 19 who drowned. And you know, what's important too to point out is that for every childhood death, you know, there are thousands and thousands of you know, ER visits, right? So we, we, we tend to focus on you know, the death, but we don't really, you know, really think through like, you know, for every, for, I'll just give you a statistic is, you know, for basically for every 8,000 deaths in the U S you know, you'll have 7.7 million ER visits and 60,000 of those are nursery nursery related. So very, very young children. So like I said, it's, it's important to really take the whole scope in and then create a set of solutions around those. And those are those, you know, those, those life-saving skills. And that would also include pediatric first aid, you know, how to prevent an accidental poisoning, you know, something we just did, we just shot a video recently that had to do with poisoning. And a lot of people will think about poisoning such as bleach and, you know, household products, but what's, what's been a serious issue has actually been something called button or disc batteries. So these are these little batteries and these little shiny little circular batteries that you'll find in, you know, any number of toys and, and, you know, those greeting cars that open up in the, you know, like there's a figure that's, you know, you know, making like a music and they're dancing around. Usually that's, that's powered by one of these button disc batteries. And that, like I said, they're shiny and, and a lot of kids will actually swallow those. And it's become such a problem. And I highlight it in the book along with a couple of stories that they actually had to create a separate poison control line just for the batteries. Isn't that amazing? It's like, it's, it's just one of those things that you don't think about. But, um, so I put that in there as well. And I also highlighted in the book, you know, home and apartment fire safety and escape plans. And that is so important. You know, having a, a, something as simple as having a designated place where you meet in the case of a home fire, that everybody knows where that spot is. You know, that, that, that came out of a story from my CPR instructor who instructed me first right after Marcus choked. And, you know, this was, it's so, it was so sad. It was a childhood friend of his. And basically what happened is, you know, they, they had a, a home fire, a major home fire. Everybody, you know, left the house. And, and when they all, you know, were in the front yard, they realized that the daughter and this uh, friend's sister wasn't in the front yard. So what happened? Well, uh, the father goes back in the house and he passed away. And what they didn't realize was that the daughter actually did get out safely, but she was in the backyard. So having a designated safety place to meet, designated meeting place in the case of a home fire could have saved that life, right? She would have known, hey, I'm going to go in the backyard. I'm going to go immediately go to the front to, let's say, a tree in the front yard or wherever they designated that spot. So it's these, these little but big things that I really brought out and, and highlight in the book. Well, I got a couple of questions about your masterclass. The first sure. question is, it's a two-part question. Tell parents that take the course what, what they can expect when they take the course. And I know you said it was video. So my second question is, if a parent like me who is blind takes the course, is the video going to be descriptive enough so that I understand what's going on? Because a lot of videos out there, they assume that you that you can see the video. So I would need to make sure I have enough description for it to benefit me. It's, it's, I love that question. And here's the reason why I thought when I was shooting the videos that I was actually getting too granular, like a little bit too detailed on it. And so what I, what I, what I did was, and that's I said, well, listen, if I'm going to make these videos masterclass, I have to basically talk them through it first and then show them, not just show them. So here's why I am doing each step followed by the actual demonstration. 
So, and I thought again, like when I was shooting and I was like, man, that these videos, some, some of them can go a little bit long, but I, but I really wanted to get detailed in that sense. So that, yeah, that is a very good question. I would love for you to go in and, and tell me what your experience is, but I really sought to get that detailed where, where that would be, you know, something that, uh, you know, be addressed in there in, in the sense of that amount of detail. And they're able to accurately, not only, you know, when I talk about it, I talk about it, so they kind of get an idea of what they're about to see, but when they actually see it, they understand why I did what I did. So I really appreciate that question. As far as the experience is concerned, I, you know, I've sort of always been intrigued with the thought of creating a video book just because of those earlier statistics. So that's kind of what I sought to do. So I took the book and not only is the book basically in the masterclass in written format, but the chapters are accompanied, most of them at least, are accompanied with instructional videos and you know, detailed videos such as you know, how to perform baby CPR, how to perform child CPR. And then what I also did to take it even a step further was you know, specifically for the CPR sequences and choking sequences is to create an action sequence so that you can see it sped up. And it's almost like if there actually was something that was happening you know, that you could actually, you would know sort of in real time, how that would look, how you would actually save them instead of you having to piece together multiple videos. And what I mean by that, and this is another, and I'd like to bring up one, one more point, because this is, this is a question I get often is, you know, well, why can't I just go and, you know, go onto YouTube, you know, and, and there's plenty of YouTube videos out there, whether it's a baby choking or, or CPR or whatever. And I, I bring up I bring up a number of the points that I brought up before, which I won't do again. But I say, well, let's I give them a scenario. Basically, I say, well, let's say for instance that you you type in you know infant CPR on YouTube, or let's say you Google it, you're going to get hundreds of thousands of responses, you know, to that search those search parameters, and you're going to get hundreds of videos, right? Well, number one, how do you know that the person is actually certified who's teaching the video that you pick, and it's not some you know, guy from, you know, from Tim from Des Moines, who just learned, you know, CPR, right? How do you know that that person is qualified, is actually certified um, as an instructor to instruct those things? And also, how do you know that you have to really look at the date? Is it up to date? Sometimes these things can change. And, and so that that's number one. Number two is, let's say in a perfect world, you learned, for instance, how to save a baby from choking, theoretically in this video. And they're like, yeah, okay. I said, great. And let's say theoretically that, you know, you saw this video and you actually remembered it six, down, six months down the line when something actually happened. Okay. Let's just say that, that all this perfect world stuff happened. And then I said, but here's a question. I said, what if it doesn't work? And they said, well, what do you mean? What if it doesn't work? What if you take those, that skill set that's in that video for how do you save your baby from choking? You perform it, but it doesn't work. The object is too far down. Did you also then learn baby CPR? And is it specific to the age of that child? Because you're going to have to learn how to do that too. And you're also not only going to have to learn how to do that too, but you're also going to have to, you know, be able to have the presence of mind, not panic. You're going to have to have it refreshed. You're literally going to have to know step-by-step how to do both of those things without panicking, remaining calm, and again, that's such a naive thing. It's dangerously naive to think that you'll, you'll have the ability to do so, whether that's the, the Friday of that you learned it or six months down the line or more. Well, this next question is a two-part question as well. Sure. The first part is, tell us about some of the most surprising life-saving tips that you came across doing your research. And the second part is, what do you mean by awareness being a life-saving skill? Sure. Um, I'll start with the first. The first one is one of the things I would actually say it's like the number one thing because, you know, after having four kids, we realized that we did it with every single one of our kids. It's like, it's amazing that any of the kids are alive based on, you know, this book, but it's never feed a child while they're in the car seat. We do that all the time, right? I mean, historically, you know, I, I did it all the time. We get in the car. And we would feed the kid, we give them, you know, what, whatever it was, you know, the puff things or, you know, whatever, whatever would basically pacify them, make for a nice trip, right? So they would keep them occupied. 
And, you know, the, the, there's a, you know, an inherent problem there. I mean, number one is that you're going to have for a period of time, at least you're going to have a rear facing car seat, right? And then once it becomes front facing, what's, what's typically happening there is you're relying on your rear view mirror, which is usually not aimed towards them. And if it is, you're looking at the road and kids can become unconscious. Like I said earlier, within less than two minutes and choking is a silent event. They're, they're not going to, if, if they could tell you what's going on, they're not actually choking, right? They're not going to be able to speak and not make a lot of noise, right? And so, unfortunately, what had happened was, you know, by the time the parents got to the destination, it was too late. So, they didn't hear it or, you know, you know just, just kind of normal parenting is you think, okay, well, they're silent, so that must be good. <laughs> they must be, or they fell asleep, right? So, that was the, the most surprising one. It's like, wow. Like never feed a child in their car seat. And a, and a mother I was talking to, you know, she's like, I can't believe we've always done that. So, you know, my recommendation, of course, therefore, is to obviously feed the kid, you know, feed the children before you go. Uh, and then obviously when you get, obviously when you get to your destination, that's fine. Or if it's a super long trip and you, you know, you feel like you have to do something, have a puree, have a smoothie, you know, have something that, that the consistency is, is, you know, not going to be a hazard, you know, yogurts assuming they're not allergic and, and that type of thing. And I would say, you know, as far as the, you know, awareness being a skill that actually came from another mother, she had, she has three, she actually just had her third child. But at the time we spoke, she had two and one of her daughters was just like my daughter, Lana, who is just like, you know, she seeks danger. She finds danger a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just one of those kids that, you know, some kids, you know, are kind of careful and conscientious, but this one's, you know, she's probably going to be riding motorcycles when she's seven or whatever. So she's just one of those, you know, those, those spirits. And she said, you know, Mark, she says, you know, awareness, my daughter makes me aware because she freaks me out. <laughs> I always like, I'm always watching her. And, and that, that was such an important point is again, you know, when we talk about a skill is really the ability to use your knowledge effectively. And if you're not even looking at them or even watching them, how can you even use anything? You're not even going to know anything happens. So we really want to get to the point where parents are able to perform well enough not to panic. That's the metric we would use. You have the ability to know something well enough where you, know, you can perform that skill, remain calm when they need you the most. And I'll give you one more one more interesting story, because we touched on drowning before. There was a study to come out of Germany. And, you know, in Germany, they were noticing, you know, how many drownings there were. And one of the outcomes of that study was that a big part of the problem was distracted parents. I mean, we, we see it all the time. You know, if you're, if you're not, I say in one of my videos, if you're, if you're looking down at your phone, that means you're not looking up at your kids, right? So that situational awareness that awareness of, you know, your surroundings and, hey, what could, what could, it doesn't mean being paranoid. It's not about being paranoid. It's really just about, like I said, being situationally aware, being able to go in somewhere, whether that's your house and, or somebody else's house, because a lot of times there's problems in somebody else's house where it's not your natural environment, but be able to be aware and say, okay, now I'm in somebody else's house. What is around, depending on my child's age, that could cause problems. Or what does, what do my children gravitate towards? Like this mother, her daughter loved electrical cords. <laughs> like she would go play with electrical sockets. So you can imagine that was a disaster for the mom was constantly like, you know, uh, freaking out about that. And so whenever she would go over to somebody else's house, she would say, listen, do you have the plastic plugs in, you know, and that type of thing. So she would assess the issue. Um, so that's what I mean by awareness is a skill. We have to look at it as a skill at this point, not only like we talked about earlier with the, you know, the child choking and actually having a visual looking at your child, but on a, you know, from a swimming perspective, it's really being your own child's lifeguard, not relying on other people. They're actually your responsibility. And if, and if you're not there, it's your responsibility to make sure that there are certain things in place, such as a designated water watcher is there, right? I mean, there are any number of stories that even, even in my father's church, there was a young boy who drowned and it was at a pool party. It was at a church pool party with tons of people around, tons of people in the pool. And they didn't know what was happening until it was far too late. 
the child actually passed away. So if you have it, have a designated water watcher, you know, that's, that's important step. At the end of the day, it is your child. It's going to be your responsibility. So that awareness is so, so important. Well, let's talk about any upcoming projects or, you know, things that you're working on that people need to know about. Well, one of the things we're really excited about, we're, we're doing a lot of talking to hospitals. One of the things that I, I, I'm very passionate about is, you know, and you know this, I'm sure, is no matter how many kids you have, you know, it's never, you never go out of that hospital feeling like, oh yeah, I got this. <laughs> never happened. It doesn't matter on the fourth child, you know, that first year, especially those first few days, but in reality, that first year is talk about high anxiety, right? Because I mean, that, that's when they're, they are the most vulnerable. And so part of the, the, you know, talking with the hospitals and also OBGYNs and pediatricians, I feel like where we can make the biggest impact globally on this issue is if we start this education in hospitals. And, and, and if you want to take a step before that, you know, you really start to, a mother really starts to really have that sort of anxiety at about 32 weeks, about eight weeks before, you know, they give, like, it just starts to ramp up a little bit. And so we would, and, and in fact, you know, it's, it's mentioning that point is that's really when you should also start thinking about baby safety is about eight weeks before. Cause if you think about it, you're probably, you know, going to be creating, you know, where are they going to sleep? You know, what's their crib going to look like? You know, and there's so many, so many tips just about cribs and just about like nurseries and bassinets. And, you know, there's any number of tips there, but also a lot of parents aren't aware. And this is one of those things that, you know, surprised me as well, Curtis, to your earlier question is the eight weeks before giving birth is also a great time to install the car seat. Now, when you think about the car seat, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that, you know, um, obviously they're aware of that it needs to be installed properly, but, you know, there are events in nearly any city or within, you know, within miles of a major city that you can go to. And whether it's a police station, sometimes it's run by, I can provide a link for you. There's, a, there's an organization called Safe Kids Worldwide, which is an amazing organization. And you can actually click on a link on their website to find a, you know, a car seat installation event near you. And that way, you know that it's installed correctly. And so that goes right back to the point was, you know, what if they, what if the child came early, right? What if the baby came a little bit early and you weren't prepared for that? The key is if you do it eight weeks, or at least you're close to doing it, you know, eight weeks before um, that way, you know, if there were a baby came a little bit early, you're, you're, you're prepared. You don't have to do any more research. You don't have to, you know, go and scramble while your wife is at the hospital, you know, to try to get that car seat, get it installed correctly, go to an event or get, get it done by a local police station or fire station, you've thought this through. So we really want to, that's another part of awareness. You know, what are the things we should be thinking about how to create a, sleep, a safe sleep environment is, is super, imp- I mean, I can't tell you how important that is. And that's, that's one of the keys, depending on the age, that first year, you know, really making sure that you understand how to significantly lower your risk of sudden infant death syndrome and, you know, accidental suffocations and strangulations is so important. The only problem I would say with installing a car seat early is not necessarily installing it. It's that if your baby is premature, the regular car seat that you brought might not work. That that is true. That is true. If if they're if it's early enough, you could what basically what we did with our car seats is there are car seats that actually come with extra attachments for that very point. Like the, the, I think it was the headrest that they that it came out. And so if the child was, the baby was younger, you could insert that for the younger the baby. Of course, if it's super early, you have to, I mean, what's going to end up happening there is they're going to be in the hospital for longer. They're not going to let the, a baby that's not ready to go home, go home. So take, taking that into account as well. But yeah, I mean, it's really, it's a matter of, you know, this was, this is pointed out. And I, I mentioned this quote in the book. It's really doing the best we can. That's at the end of the day, we have to do the best we can. And, you know, with parents, it's just a matter of providing them with this information and them, you know, hopefully communicating it to them in a way that really gets that awareness up and then that mobilizes them to learn these things and to take this very, very seriously. You know, the, and I'll, the last statistic, you know, my, that really got me 
to this day, it's it's hard to even say, is that you know worldwide, in the next year, statistically speaking, uh, nearly a million children will not make it to the age of five. Right? That that's not due to war, disease, or famine. It's due to accidental injuries, and so part of this mission is not just for the U.S. It's it's really to do something globally, and I think that's why one of the best ways of doing that is to really get into the hospitals and the pediatricians offices and OBGYN offices and, and really try to do that as well as, you know, social media and, you know, the Instagrams, Facebooks, and that type of thing. Speaking of social media, throw out your contacts. If you have any websites uh, so people can stay connected with you and check out everything that you're up to. Yeah, I appreciate that. So the website is ourchildskeeper.com. Uh, and for the book, it's emergencythebook.com. And, you know, we have links to all the socials um, on the main website. And I'd love to hear from everybody. It's always fun to hear not only from the parents, by, but I always open it up. I said, if there's something that's in the book or there's something that you've heard, these, you know, any tip that you've heard that we don't cover, please let me know. I mean, because the beauty of this book these days is that it can, it's basically like a living document. And what I mean by that is I can go into Amazon and I can update it. You know, I can, I can go in there and update it and it'll be updated. And then by the time they print it and send it to you, it's updated. So I love to hear, there's so many tips in here like that I would, that I would get from not only that I never knew of that actually happened to me, you know, but also happened to a nurse that's an ER nurse who reached out and said something, or my friend from New York, who's an EMT he would reach out and say something to me. So by all means, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, if we missed anything, which I'm sure we you know, can never be 100%, we'd love to hear any tips that you may have. Yeah. And if I missed anything, give us some final thoughts to close us out and touch on what I might have missed. I appreciate that. I think the, the, final, the final thoughts you know, for, for me is to really just start thinking that our first responsibility is to protect our kids. And that doesn't mean just us. It also means anybody taking care of our kids. And, and I think the, the awareness is a skill. It really covers a lot of area, right? It really is one of those things. Like if you're aware of the problem, number one, that's when it really becomes, it comes on you as the parent to do something about it. And I think, you know, one of the things I, or a lot of the things we talked about here, you know, just highlighting is, is really also thinking about if I'm going to commit to being a leader, both the mother and the father, because that's one of the things like we, we never know who's going to be around when a crisis happens. So we can't just have one parent know the skill. They both need to know the skill. Anybody taking care of the kid, they, the children, they need to know the skills as well. So again, it comes right back to awareness, but also doing something about it and doing it in a way that it actually is a skill and not just something that you heard and that you're going to easily forget. So I would just say in closing, like really look at it from a leadership perspective. There's a quote on my website and, and I, you know, it just came to me when I was doing it is, is I'm going to paraphrase because I'm not looking at it, but it was basically, I believe that our children are silently begging us to be leaders, to lead them and, you know, be that leader. They are looking to you to protect them. And it's, it's important that you know how to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, it is also important that you go to Mark's two websites, ourchildskeeper.com and emergencythebook.com. It is also important for you to follow, rate, review, and share this episode to as many people as possible, whether they might be expecting parents or already parents. You never know what information Mark has given on this episode that might help save a child's life. I also would like Android listeners to go to the Google Play Store and download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app. Mark, I appreciate you for joining me today. Curtis, thank you so much. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.